G'day guys. Had a few people message me on repairing these mine lab detectors. And I thought of all the detectors we should look at, it's probably the most um, prolific one out there still, is the GPX series. And I'll give a, a little bit of a talk on the common parts that fail on these detectors. So this is a board here, and I've got it zoomed in, but this came off a quad bike at very high speed, and it absolutely smashed the uh, end caps, um, caved in the, the case of the detector, and we would have thought that the circuit board would have survived. It didn't. This is dead as a dodo. And I'd say there is uh, internal fractures inside some of the um, copper traces inside the board layers. So it's probably impossible to fix. But we can use it as a demonstrator on what blows up. And if, it, if you have a detector and you um, have it come off a quad bike and it, it doesn't turn on afterwards, well... You, things you'd, you'd want to look for is these capacitors. If these, because of their mass, they can actually come loose and uh, the soldered pins here, this is still soldered on this one. I have to get this down because I'm so zoomed in. But uh, what actually happens on these, there we go. You can see these, if it if it capacitor moved uh, left and right, and you can see the leg through the solder there moving, that would probably be a cause of failure. Uh, the, the, the problem is that the capacitor is soldered to the other side of the board, and the capacitor moving will rip up the track. And if it did, it would have no power. It's not the case on this one, I've already checked for that, but there's something else uh, far worse, and this is just dead as a dodo. But, like I say, okay, first things, you're out in the field, your detector won't work. It's noisy, or it's making strange noises. Um, this here usually is the culprit. That is a 200 volt rated 3 amp, P-channel MOSFET. This is part of the flyback clamping circuit in conjunction with this capacitor here. And on the other side of the board, if I get my bearings straight, all around that bit there, that is a floating um, regulation for that flyback pulse. It clamps it at 185 volts. Or roundabouts, not exactly. I've had them at 165, one, you know, 180, 190. Uh, you've got to be careful if it starts getting towards 200 because everything on that uh, line, uh, which has this 200 volts on it, the most of the components are only rated to 200 volts. So if you go over that, there's a very high chance that you'll start popping things. The regulation is controlled by a feedback network and it all lives in these resistors here. So you check those resistors or you'd look at these um, op amps. They're just, um, uh, there's a comparator and uh, two dual op amps in there. I think they're, um, the op amps are Excalibur Phillips or what they call themselves an Xperia series. So in this network here, you know, you might have a re uh, resistor gone open or come detached under the white paint on the board. Very hard to find. But in most cases, uh, if you want to find if something's detached, get something like the end of a pen, have the thing on, push on them and see if something jumps to life. It's the quickest and easiest way to do it. You know, you can heat it up and cool it down, but if the, if the pad's not touching or the um, resistors come adrift. The, sometimes the um, plating on the end of these resistors, I know they just look like white little 
specs, but uh, the plating through thermal cycling uh, can come off the carbon body or metal film body, whatever type of resistor it is. It's um, another thing. Okay, so you have your flyback pulse generated by this one here. This one here does, uh, for memory, it does a long pulse. That is a, N, uh, yes, it is an N-channel MOSFET. And so is that one that does the small pulses, the 15 volt pulses. So they are just, this one here is actually a high power version of that one. It has a solderable pad area under the IC, which is part of the IC. And that actually soldered um, to the board, probably through a thermal process, uh, maybe infrared. I don't know if it's done through our oven. And uh, yeah, normally um, the pads here on the, on the uh, oh, I see, am I in the right spot? Sorry, yep. These go nowhere, but internally they're connected to the pad underneath. And you'll have one of these go to the junction of these two diodes here and the other one will go under here hang on oops okay it'll go under here and connect at this point as you can see there's two lumps there they did have four diodes in these detectors then they realized they only need three and uh, <laughs> because you've got the um, join there and the way both of them connect both um, output uh, stages connect to a common point. Well, the energy will go through, oops, it'll go through that diode, then through that diode, then back into the clamping circuit. So it doesn't need this diode that, that was there. So someone woke up and said, oh, we only need three diodes, we don't need four. So they saved themselves a dollar or two. Okay, what else blows up on these? Now, I was saying that uh, one of the most common ones is that um, P-channel MOSFET there. Yep, that uh, definitely blows up. But the, the thing is, if this goes open circuit, it's going to allow more than 185 volts, give or take, across the rest of the circuit, because this, this is your clamp. If it goes open circuit, you're going to start popping a lot of things. That's if the detector does not turn off. So what happens if that happens? Well, these, these output stages here are rated to 200 volts. Okay. All this here is rated to a lot lower, but I'll get onto that in a minute. This is um, the input stage to your op amps, which I'm sliding off the camera. It's very hard looking in the back of a, um, a phone screen and looking at what you're pointing at at the same time. So please forgive if I am out of um, view at what I'm doing. The next main failure point, or actually can be blown up if uh, that uh, goes open circuit. So I even lose my own bearings on these sometimes. Is these two MOSFETs here, they're N channel 200 volt rated MOSFETs. They are the first line of the switching for the receiver input. They block the transmit um, pulse. Um, and well, there's, there's, you need two, two in series to, the way they do it to block the transmit pulse. But also these stand off the flyback um, pulse at the 200 volt, um, we'll, we'll call it, how about we just call it 200 volts instead of 185, 195, or 165, whatever I've seen it. Okay, so these things um, turn off and that uh, flyback clamped voltage can't get through, all right? But if these fail, it can. And what it does, it'll go through these. Usually um, it will brown it. You can see on the white paint that it goes brown. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. And if these things short out, which is a, co a very common occurrence because they're so, you know, they're rated at 200 volts, right? And in re realistic to speak, you've got 190 volts sitting 
on it. It's asking a lot. There's not a lot of headroom there. Uh, if it, you know, you get uh, some spike event, very fast transient, uh, your 200 volt um, uh, reservoir or clamp capacitor starts drying out and, uh, you know, it goes high impedance. It can allow very fast transients to get through and blow these things to pieces. Well, not to pieces, but short them out. And that will then have a flow on effect. I'll spin it around that way into your input stage. It'll go into, now let's go try and uh, get that set right. You got uh, two N channel MOSFETs here. You got two input stages on these, that's why there's two uh, N channel high voltage MOSFETs on the other side of the board. And uh, these go to, if I get it right, that one there, where the tip of the pen is on, that is a very small N-channel MOSFET. It's 60 volts, uh, 100 milliamps or something. And the other one is there. So there's, there's no symmetry in the design. One's there and one's there. I mean, it's electrically symmetrical, but the layout is not, right? So you got to remember, you know, you might think, oh, that's that, um, the MOSFET there, that's the MOSFET for that one. No, it's not. That's a BAV99 protection diode. Like that one there is a BAV99 protection diode. And uh, that there is your MOSFET, and that's your other MOSFET. If those N-channel high-voltage ones fail, it will take these out. The other thing it can take out, there is a BF... Uh, 998 dual gate MOSFET here and here, one for each input channel. It can take those out as well. These are um, very clever, the utilization of these. This uh, gets around using a fixed resistor for bias to these op amps on the non inverting inputs. And these uh, dual gate MOSFETs, basically one MOSFET's left on, turned on, it's connected to positive volts on the uh, gate. And the other one is switched on and off by the ADG, was it ADG? Uh, triple three on the other side of the board. And what that does, it supplies bias current to the op amps and also across that non-inverting and inverting. The 10K resistor, which is hidden on the back of the board, it's very hard to find. Uh, they're very small, and I'll show you that in a second. And what that does is stop these things uh, losing their bias current, and you would have a problem when the receiver comes back on, they probably may not be stabilized. So you've got bias current when the uh, receiver stage is on because this is this uh, MOSFET's on, that one's on. Sorry, that MOSFET's on, that MOSFET's on. The end channel ones on the back of the border on, they're connected to the coil to ground. So you've got your bias current um, available that way. But uh, when it's in uh, transmit or um, you know any any you know non-receive mode, it wouldn't have any bias because everything is back biased. So they use this. And by using the dual gate arrangement, it also reduces um, a parasitic capacitance effect called Miller effect, uh, which is very problematic in wideband high speed amplifiers. And these are set up as high speed wideband amplifiers. Basically, there's no filtering, they just, they'll just they suck in anything. Uh, the only thing that limits the uh, amplification on you know whatever high frequency you shove up there is just the parasitic capacitance um, of the design itself and you don't want parasitic capacitance it slows things down so yeah it, it's a vast improvement than just dumping a 33k ohm resistor to ground what they used to do in the old designs in the uh, SDs so 
Um, yeah, so that can blow up, that can blow up, that can blow up. It can take those out as well. Um, I don't know the actual mechanism why the uh, BA, no, not the BA, the um, BF998s get blown up because they are connected through a 10 ohm resistor to non inverting input and via a 10,000 ohm resistor uh, to the um, non inverting input, which basically loop, loops through the, this thing here to, um, to ground. So it goes from the non-inverting input through the resistor and the end of that resistor is connected to the 10 ohm resistor on the in, um, inverting input and this switches, the MOSFET switches the uh, other end of that uh, resistor to ground depending on what cycle it's in. Anyway, you can have those all blow up the worst thing is, is it blows up the input op amps, right? And they're AD797s, and today they are so expensive. Uh, I was having a look, even uh, at a good price, you know, they only won 20 bucks each for these things. You know, it's very expensive. Uh, the other thing can blow up too, it can, it can also um, avalanche the... Uh, coil driver stages, take those out. Uh, these diodes are only rated for 200 volts as well. Oops, there we go. They're rated for 200 volts. You can avalanche those as well. So you can have a, just having one end channel um, high voltage MOSFET fail, uh, unless the detector shuts down, it can just, you know, take out everything. It just takes out everything. Just just uh, like hit, getting hit with lightning, literally. And yeah. So if, it, if anything does fail, if this fails, you want it to go short circuit because it's, you know, it doesn't allow anything to um, get destroyed. Uh, what else is there on these common failures? Well, the thing, uh, this has got um, pins. This is an old one. All the new ones have that push-in mylar strip, which uh, I've got one here. Oops, look at that, wobble, wobble. That's a push-in mylar strip, and I, I'm gonna tell you about these things, all right? These are another failure point. First of all, on the connector, if this is loose, the plastic body, I mean, not the uh, internal part, if that's loose, and you're pushing your core, uh, your connector, either, um, in or out or whatever, and it starts flexing the pins in relation, like one pin will flex or a whole lot of flex. It breaks the connection, it's very hard to see, but it breaks it right next to the solder joint on the, on the mylar. Under that mylar, these, these tracks, they're all copper, very, very thin copper. You can see that you, that's an earth point, ground point there, thin copper. And it goes to negative input there. And this one here is your positive input. So if these things are wobbled and that, it will crack. It's very hard to spot. You need to get a multimeter on these, trace them, and make sure that uh, you put it in beep beep or um, continuity testing and just wiggle the hell out of this thing and see if it uh, the meter drops in and out also these break right <laughs> and it's a real horrible place where they break they break I don't know if you can see it here see this um, backing piece here there's a, a thicker piece of um, material here which allows you to push this whole section into the connector without it bending and breaking, but it breaks along here. It's very hard to see again. These are control lines and so forth. Your detector will go completely bonkers if any of these break. These two here are your audio. You'll have crackly audio on and off if these two here break, but you've got data lines here and uh, these two thick ones are your power. So, you know, you, you um, 
you turn on from your toggle switch, everything is all down these lines. Your data uh, for your um, back display is on these. It also has to talk to the CPU on the main board to turn the thing on. So, yep. Now, the other thing it breaks, I think I've done articles in Gold, German Treasure on this before. This, right? And where it breaks is right in the midpoint along here. Again, it's very, very hard to see because it ends up being a hairline fracture. So what I do, and, and you've got to be careful doing this, right? The, the top, top part here is perfectly okay. But what I do, I get a pair of scissors and very carefully, right, chop off about one and a half mil or two, two millimeters. That allows the connector, instead of being here, you see where it pushes on. It's now on the clean part here. So that's a quick bush fix. If your mylars start playing up, which is so damn common, um, the, these things are, yeah, one of the biggest failures in these detectors is the mylar strips. But, you know, you can do bush fixes. You cut it, you know, you don't cut it right there because it'll get too close up there and it's insulated. You just want to take a trim right off the bottom. And to do that in the bush, you'll need you'll need the right tool. Most people take screwdrivers with them, but uh, you're not going to take a tool to undo those, are you? It's one of those hex things. So, you know, get a, get a kit of those um, hex driver little things and uh, whichever one fits in those on your detector, well, you can pull it apart out in the field, can't you, and do a quick fix. That's, there's be nothing worse than being out in the middle of the Pilbara and your detector goes wonky. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you wanted to, you could probably take all the components that readily fail on these and fix it out in the bush if you're good at soldering. Um, maybe I can explain how to do that in a later video. But yeah, you gotta check here. There's also a, what I call the, um, yeah, it's a, it's a real sneaky one here. It's off the positive line. I don't know if you can see it. There's a little, you know, here we go. See that little, there's a little track here somewhere. Is it on that one? I think it might be that one there. It's on the other side of the mylar. It goes there, it flips position through that there, comes around, and it goes to the power switch, which I'll move up a bit, and it connects to the power switch. I think it's under the white paint there, and it goes under and it connects onto this. I don't know if you can actually see it. If I held a light up behind, you could probably see it. But that breaks, right? And your detector won't turn on. So that's a real bugger. What I usually do, if you have that happen out in the bush as a bush fix, solder a wire on to that point there. Normally this has a um, your toggle switch on it. Solder a wire there, take it down and solder it there on the positive. And now you're not relying on that mylar connection. And if you turn the thing on and off, it'll turn on and off. So just insulated wire, bang on there, stick it on there. There's a bush fix. Uh, your detector will now turn on if that was the problem. It does break. Uh, it has broken many times on these things. Uh, when you start getting breaks on the mylar, I can tell you one thing. Because it's copper, right? It's very thin copper. You're out in the bush and you're driving around and going over bumpy roads, this thing's doing this. Wobble, 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 bend, bend, bend. And you know what happens when you work hard in copper? By banging it and bending it and twisting it, it becomes very brittle and eventually it snaps. So you could have um, breaks all in here. You, you won't see it. And you just move it like that, and the, and the thing will go, you know, turn on, turn off, crackle the audio, do all sorts of weird stuff. So that's one to look out for. When in doubt, replace the whole mylar. And you have to be careful when you do it. You can't just push it on and solder this and then push it over there and, and solder that. If you um, solder this on without relieving the stresses in the mylar, it will break the copper. 
you've got to relieve the stresses out of this thing when you put it on. You've got fixtures here on your rotary encoders. You've got your switch. You, it's, you know, you've got to clean everything up that was on there very, very clean and make it all um, on a level plane if you can. You've got to make sure there's nice curvatures, can't have any sharp bends. Sharp bends, like I was saying, that happen here, which um, break break the mylar right there. It, it, you can't help that because of the way it's designed. It, it will break. If you move this in and out all the time, it'll break. Now on the other end of this mylar, which goes into the display board, you've got this thing here. Same thing. See where those... Um, where it uh, goes into the connector, they push in the middle. Uh, that is a breakage point. Give it a haircut. All right, two mil off, stick it back in. That's if you're having um, any sort of strange control function problems, you can just redo that. And, you know, if, you can, if you've got a problem like you want to track these out of your multimeter in continuity mode, it's very difficult uh, to keep the tip on something that small, but it can be done. You know, I've done it. You put it on the, it go, they go through, end up here, or they end up on the um, connectors here. Track it through. You can see where, where they go. And just wiggle it and bend it. And if it's turning on and off, what you can do, and this is this is really, really difficult, right? So you got um, breaking continuity from here and a break here and somewhere the brakes in the middle and you can't you can't see it you don't know where it is it's very hard to spot because the mylar keeps everything lined up and it's got a coating over it you can't see the brake you'll know it's there because you'll wiggle it and it'll you know be on and off on and off but what you can do um, for these brakes very very carefully solder a wire and don't use a lot of solder to do this. You just tack it on the end here. Not down here where it goes in the plug because it won't go in the plug anymore. But tack it right up here. And try and run the wire on here. Follow where it goes. But don't stick it on that. It's That's painful. What I would do, if I can find one to show you, um, have I, well, I've got one here, yeah, I'll just take this one off, okay, this is just a 5,000 that I repaired, but, uh, where are we, down here, okay, you can see where this goes into the connector, you can see here, you could solder on that, but it's so damn small, it's painful, you're better off soldering here, these line up with the traces. So you're better off just very carefully with a nice pointy iron, heat that up and solder a wire there and run it around. You can stick it on these if you're that good. I mean, it's not that hard. To remove this, don't pull it out like yank. See, on the side, they've got locking tabs, right? You've got to do this. Up. I rock it. It's too hard to pull in one hit. Those tabs are up, okay? And that will now just wiggle it side to side a bit, slowly, and out she pops. And you can see the pressure marks on that as well. But this one's okay. It's been sitting there for a while. To put it back in. Make sure the tabs stay up. Don't push it in like a gorilla, you'll break it. Push it in like so. As you can see before, it wasn't in all the way anyway, and I never touched this. You can see those, um, the copper there is, uh, it's disappeared, it's, it's gone further in. So, uh, lightly push down, and at the same time, slide onto those tabs with your fingers, and push. So, yeah, you'd be hard push soldering a, a wire on the top there. You could do it, but, you know, it'd be too much interference with the plastic. So go, go for the bottom pins. 
So that's how you fix mylar strips out in the bush when they, they fail. And it it is damn common. When you buy when you buy mylar strips, we have mylar strips, believe it or not, somewhere. Um, that's wobbling around like crazy. Now, like I was saying, these are for the newer type detectors. That's how they look. And the old type of detector, well, it's not the old, it's the old version of the um, 4500. They have these pins. So in most cases, you want to keep the connector from the old detector. And you need to, you know, pull it apart. It's a very difficult job. And solder one of these. Don't sol never ever solder that to that. That is a nightmare waiting to happen. Because if anything goes wrong, what are you going to do? You know, it's very you'll just destroy the mylar trying to take it off. So you got to use the connectors. It's much better to use the connectors than trying to you know do some jerry rig type thing like so. You can get new connectors, you can buy them through JCAR or Mouser or DigiKey or Arrow or any, anyone, uh, Farnell, Radio Spares, Rochester Electronics. Um, yeah, I think I rambled off all the uh, good ones. What else fails on these? Okay, you drop your detector, okay? This is common too, you drop your detector nice hard drop what will happen like I was saying about you look at this one here see where the capacitors they're being glued on whoops I'm on the wrong capacitor I've got to go further over there we go see where it's glued on that right if that pulls sideways that's okay because the pins are you know not in that um, plane they're running perpendicular to the movement there you can see where they are there those two pins it's rocking that way it's rocking you know on the pins but if it rocked you know that way to the to that side and that side you know that these had pulled out and maybe you could fix it push the capacitor down hard with your finger like so and get someone to solder those resolder them it, it, it can happen the other thing with mass um, that can come adrift. Oops, where we go. The ferrite transformer and the inductor. These are fairly heavy. You've usually got, um, you know, leads coming out, so it's not going to pull out. But I think, uh, is there one of these? There's, there's one of these that might have a pin. Oops. Might have a, um, a pin under the board that solders through it. It can uh, pull through. I haven't replaced an inductor for about six years. So not, not a failure thing, but, you know, if it comes unglued, won't work. The other thing too, which we've had on board flexors, is we've had, I did a video on this, how to reflow solder these. It's tricky you got to be knowing what you're doing to do it but you can repair it if any of these come come off uh, just thinking what else what else what else what else there has been um, various standard component failures um, I've had it under here where are we I got to try and find where I am I'm too far that way there we go. This here is, um, what is it? It's a 4053 multiplex, multiplexer. Uh, that that um, selects, um, you know, your DD cancel mono, um, how, how the configuration is from the, your two input stages into this. This can play up. I've had these play up and it, it won't change modes or uh, it, it will stay locked in something. It'll, it won't budge from, um, you know, cancel. It'll stay there or stay in mono or stay in double D um, or do something completely 
different and try and put them all on at once or whatever. Um, that also, with these components, they are glued onto the board. You've got to be damn careful that when you try and get them off the board, if the glue still adhered, right, and, you know, you're thinking, oh, yeah, you know, um, we'll just put some more heat on it and, uh, you know, you're trying to break that seal there and you haven't heated these up with enough solder or, you know, they've gone cold with the solder I'm falling off. And there we go. If they are not totally blobbed with solder and you've cleaned them up and got solder on every pin and they're, both sides are hot, you'll, you'll flick this up and it'll ripple the tracks off, right? And that is major, major disaster, right? Because it, everything is so fine and trying to reattach little tiny wires and things. Um, if you do that, your detector's very close to being a write-off. It's probably better. When you're getting into these very small pitch pin or leg ICs, it's better off letting someone with the equipment do it. Uh, simple things like, you know, retouching, uh, you know, resistors. I called them capacitors last time. They're, they're inductors. Whoops. I did. I, I On another video, I said they were capacitors. They're actually inductors. So, uh, so... You know, if, you, if you're checking with a, um, an ohm meter, it'll read a short, more or less. You know, it'll only be half an ohm or something. Just, you know, you put on beep range, it'll go beep, beep, you know, as you go across them all, so you know they're all connected. They connect to these pins here. It's just to stop stray, um, you know, artifacts of signal or whatever getting through. Uh, what else is there? Oh, some of the older... Oh, this is an interesting one. You're going to love this. Um, on some of the older GPXs, and this, this is, not many people know about this, but a few people do. This capacitor here, or let me have a look. That capacitor there, that capacitor there, that one there, that one there, and oops, I'm running off the, where am I? Down. Hang on a sec. I've got to go further over. I'm bumping into the detector on the board, with the board. Yeah. Okay. These ones here. That line, you can see all those 4053s there. It's not the big capacitors above them here, there, there, but there, those ones. You can see a white line painted across them. Not that, just those. So there's one, two, three, let me see. One, two, three, four, five. Five of those capacitors, right? Somewhere in the, in the old history of things, the wrong capacitor values got installed by their pick and place machine. Don't know how it happened, but a whole heap of detectors come out the wrong values here. And also, again, I'm going down here somewhere, if I remember rightly, yeah, across. You can see here, this capacitor here, it's been touched up with white, paint, that one there, they're also part of the um, wrong part install. So it's that one, that one, the five up there, um, and I'm just looking at the board to see if I remember, yes there was, there is, there's another one, there, that one there, you can see where it, on the corner of the board, that's basically where the power goes in, you can see the power connection there. And that capacitor there, that's been replaced as well. Now, whatever value went in there, I can't remember it. It was so long ago. But um, they're meant to be 18 nanofarads. All of them are 18 nanofarads. So if you have a GPX and it's of the vintage that has those pins and you think your detectors never behave properly or not as good as other detectors, what I would do is I would take one of these capacitors off. Alright, I take, say, if you have a look at the placement, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, right? Take them off, one off. <laughs> Solder a couple of very, very small wires to it 
and stick it in a capacitance meter, an accurate one, not a bodgy um, one, but something that can measure down to picofarads, and see if they measure around 18 nanofarads. If they measure that value, they are the correct ones. Just solder it back on. If they don't, and there's some other value, because it's part of the filtering system here, right? Change all the ones here to the same 18 nanofarad, and the ones down below there, change that and that and that to 18 nanofarad. I think it was just someone's loaded the wrong reel into the, um, the pick and place machine and it's just gone bang, bang, bang. And they might, I can't remember what they were. It might be 1.8 or something, but you know, if the wrong, it'll, it'll probably have um, low VCO audio, um, the uh, swing component, I think uh, happens here um, for memory. This just mixes, um, where am I there? This one here, that just mixes the um, pulse width modulation for the audio and the amplitude together. A couple of, uh, a couple of transistors that sit there. Um, but yeah, up in this end here, uh, you, you may find your detector's gone chattery um, or it's not ground balancing properly or something. I've never got one put wrong capacitors in and gone out in the field and used it. I've had a couple come through and I've replaced the capacitors. They're gone out and everyone's been happy. So, you know, I've, capacitor wise, how many have I seen? Over probably 10 years, right? Oh, I'm guessing I've seen round about eight or 10. So not common, not common, but yeah, I, I have had them come in. I do take the, on the older versions, I take one of these off, I measure it. If it measures okay, I stick it back on. If it doesn't measure correctly, I then uh, replace those ones there and down here. Okay, the other thing too, um, about common faults, if you can see on here, this transistor here, this switches the damping resistor in and out of circuit. This can fail. Uh, it can go short, it can go open. Uh, if the damping uh, circuit uh, fails open circuit, your detector will be as noisy as all hell. And if it stays on your detector, it'll be as, if it shorts, your detector will be as deaf as all hell and it might turn the detector off. So that's just uh, another 200 volt rated, what is it, you know, three amp, um, end channel MOSFET, nothing special. Uh, you can always check your detector operation. See that diode there? That uh, is your negative 15 volts on this side of it. The fat one there, negative five volts. Uh, you, you got uh, in the middle of the board here, where's my finger there? If you actually clean that up, get the paint off it, you can, it's uh, internally plated. You can solder a blob of solder there Stick a wire in there, use it as an oscilloscope um, ground point right there. Then you can poke everything and measure it. Makes life easy. Uh, and, you know, you'd be able to see, you know, if switching waveform on the uh, gate, and you'd be able to see the functionality if you've got the detector on that uh, on one of these pins goes to ground, the other one goes onto the resistor, which goes to the coil. And that's another thing it reminds me too. The damping resistor, haha. Okay, the damping resistor is there, right? It's right near some filter capacitors for the uh, 15 volt rails. Negative 15 volts, these things switch negative, by the way. And that can go open circuit, not likely, but it can. Um, I'll be picky here. I don't like the placement of this resistor because it gets hot and you know you got a componentry there that uh, you know wants to get hot anyway it's switching the you know the power stage is switching the coil so that generates heat but I don't like it because that resistor is very very close to all the input stage it heats up the input stage and if you want to go learn about um, thermal effects on noise you can do um, you know you can go and 
learn all about Stefan Boltzmann's constants and how, how his um, um, theories on noise play into these detectors. You can go and look up um, the effect of you know, Miller capacitance um, by Harold Black, uh, who did a lot of um, work on capacitance um, effects in vacuum tubes, but it, it's the same thing in, it has the same um, effect on uh, you know normal semiconductors as well because it's it's a real thing it uh you know has a detrimental effect so you can read up on this stuff and see if you can make your, some improvements to your own detectors but yeah i think I, i've repaired hundreds and hundreds of these damn detectors you know hundreds of them like they're always coming in for repairs or upgrades or um something but yeah that's just the gpx i've seen a lot more gps um you know there's gps all over my room at the moment i keep getting them in from overseas people send them in from i've had them come in from saudi arabia from uh, russia not so much russia anymore uh, where else have they come from south africa um, all over eastern europe um, yeah Lots and lots of detectors have come in from Eastern Europe, a lot from the United States. I've actually, um, sorry, sorry guys over the United States, but uh, it's been detectors that have gone to the repair facility in the US and they can't fix them. And they've come here and I fixed them. So, uh, yeah, I fixed a lot of non-fixable ones, believe me. Um, it just takes a little bit more. It's probably, the, the reason is not their um, lack of technical knowledge, because, you know, they've got all the uh, schematics and all the information they would need. But I think it's time res time constraints. They they get a board and like like this one here, it's gone flying off a, you know, a quad bike at high speed and smashed up and whatever. And they turn it on, they go poke, poke, poke. Oh, bloody hell, it's dead. You know, maybe it is a track thing. And you're going to waste time on it trying to find it. So maybe they just say, look, it's unrepairable. Because technically it is. It is unrepairable. And I would say this is unrepairable, this one. Sad, but true. Uh, but, you know, things blowing up on boards and burning out, all the rest of it. Uh, yes. You know, it's... Um, it's Mine Lab stuff is really well designed. I'll say that, right? It really is. It's cutting edge. Um, you know, even, even these are cutting edge. They still are, you know. If you're a serious, serious prospector, what are you going to use? You're going to use mine lab detectors. You know, if you go out looking for uh, gold, especially the pulse induction detectors, I think they're magic. I've, I've looked at the other brands and that, and I'm not impressed. So there's your plug mine lab. Where's my free detector or something? I don't know. <laughs> are you joking? Um, yes, but no, I am. I, I, I think they are well designed. They haven't skimped on quality componentry in these designs. You know, a lot of work has gone into it, but you can't be a damn expert at everything. You know, like my biggest gripe is the uh, placement of that uh, resistor there. You know, at least you could have extended the legs and had it up in the air a little bit or something, but you know, I just don't like it so damn close to the op amps and things like, you know, all the sensitive uh, front end stuff. You don't want to get that hot. Um, you know, it's, it, it's just a, a, a thing. Maybe it was a parts constraint problem. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, I could have, where they stick the ferrite core here, you know, there's nothing there. You know, you look under it, what's there? Uh, yeah, you get your multiplexer. Also, you heat that up too. And heating up componentry, whoops, there I am. Heating up componentry. Uh, increases the noise. You, if you've been out prospecting, you're probably um, out in the middle of the day detecting and you'll find your detector is a hell of a lot noisy. First of all, the ground. The ground's getting hot. The ground is uh, giving off noise. Your coil's getting hot. Your coil winding is getting hot. Um, it's increasing at very small, but it's increasing in resistance. And your detector's getting hot and when you look at all those components, the added um, temperature for all these will raise the noise figure of all these components, all in parallel and all in series. 
right? It's just one of those things. Go talk to Stefan Boltzmann about it. Um, but uh, he died many, many years ago. But, the, you know, it's these these are the uh, things we have to deal with. You know, there's, there's little things there uh, that can be improved. But the overall design of this detector, you know, you, you look at it, it really is quite complex. It, it's, it's complex as in the goings on, but when you understand it, it's not that complex. You know, if you've worked out what, it, what every component is, um, you know, I could just look at this and I'll go, oh, you know, that's a, that's a 4013. Um, but, you know, I don't really want to tell everyone what all the parts are because, um, you know, mine have done such a, a great job of grinding all the part numbers off and, uh, um, you know, putting white paint over it all. But, you know, some of the stuff's really simple. Um, you know, like if you if you get this chip here and you measure it, it's funny, all, all these uh, legs on one side are connected and all those ones are connected, except for two power pins. I wonder what that could be. Hmm, might be um, 4040. Uh, this thing here, this one here, this expensive chip, that's the ADG333. Uh, that can switch uh, multiple levels of voltage through it and uh, it basically controls all the switching functions for turning um, MOSFETs on and off, um, turning you know, you, you receive lines on and off. But, um, yeah, you know, you can really break it down into, you know, you receive power supply, timing, um, area, um, audio, some audio switching is done in this, main processor, um, you know, who knows what goes on the main processor. You, you can, if you want to probe it out, you can. It's pain the proverbial. I wouldn't admit to doing it, but I, I have. Um, you know, power supply, um, th this um, is power supply here. There's just two um, FETs. Uh, I think they're in series. Something goes wrong here. You're not getting any gate voltage. You're not going to get turned on. We're not going to have smoke, hopefully. Um, you know, that's another MOSFET there. It's P-channel drives... Um, your switching transformer, um, you know, your comparators here, um, 40106 I think is there, is, is it 40106 or something else, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but you know, got them all written down. Anyway, it's enough waffle. If you're out in a bush and your detector blows up, there's some information to help you fix it on the go. Uh, the other thing too on these, I grab one without a switch, the switch, the switch, right? This thing, that movement all the time, on, off, on, off, on, off, click, 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 can, and I'll show you on this one, it's not there, can fracture where it's soldered through on the board. And it may not look fractured, but you poke it like that and you might see a crack open up. Best way to find out, use a multimeter, use continuity test. Anyway, I've gone on for way too long on this one, but it's an interesting subject. There's a lot, there really is a lot to um, say about these detectors. There's heaps more um, I can go on about uh, with uh, the GPX. I could, uh, yeah, I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but you know, it really is a well-designed detector. It really is. I like it. Even the newer detectors, um, you know, I, I stripped down a GPZ and uh, um, it's a really good design. The only thing I don't like is they encapsulated the front end, uh, basically uh, to stop me um, fiddling, I think. <laughs> I don't know. It could be for other reasons. I'm only guessing. It's my opinion. Um, but yeah, I like the, uh, I, I've had a GPZ and I've had an, an SDC 2300. And I, you know, I've got 5,000s, I've got 4,500s, I've got, you know, GP 3,500. I've got two brand new GP 3,500s. I've got, um, you know, 3,000s. I've got an SD 2,200, 2,100. I've got about four SD 2,000s. Um, so I've got all the detectors and I keep, 
you know, a lot of people probably won't understand this, but, you know, I, I know a lot of prospectors because I deal with them daily. And they, a lot of them don't like the 6,000. They say it's too noisy, right? But nothing can be done about that as far as I know. And the ones I know that are professional prospectors, try again, prospectors getting gold day in and day out, are the guys using GPXs, right? I'm not joking. There's a heap of guys um, we've done work for all up around say, the Palmer River up in Queensland. They're all using GPXs. They get a ton of gold, right? Um, there's even um, X Mine Lab uh, detector testers who use the GPX 45, well, the GPXs, I'm not going to specifically say what GPX, it might narrow down the field too much, but um, there are people that I know that stick with the GPX. It's a nice detector. Um, you know, the, the 5000 is good, but the 5000 has some depth limitations when running particular modes. It has the fine gold mode. Maybe they reduce the depth. I'm saying maybe, my opinion. Um, you're allowed to have an opinion, right? It may be that um, fine gold mode wouldn't work. Um, it would be too noisy if the gain was kept the same as the previous models of GPX. And that's why it's lowered. I don't know. Um, no, it, it, yeah, you know, like I say, I don't know. I didn't design it. So whoever designed it knows, but I bet you're not telling anyone. So, you know, we're gonna nut it out as we go. You could have um, done something like you put in a switchable gain section. So you run fine gold at reduced gain, and when you flick into the other modes, it put the gain back up to where the other GPXs were. But I do know, you can. it's easy to tell, you know, because, uh, you know, the gain resistors that control the gain of the op amps, um, the feedback resistors, are basically um, different values in a 5000 and a 4500. So gain's going to be different unless they pick it up further down the uh, chain. They don't amplify so much at the start and amplify more later. Uh, you can also do that the other way around too. You can amplify like hell at the input and amplify less later, but then there's a good chance that on very heavily mineralized ground you're going to... Uh, um, basically swamp your front end and uh, your next stages you you probably bang up your multiplexer and uh, you know everything will get noisy leakage all sorts of stuff happens uh, so yeah you know you want to run enough gain on the front of these detectors to lift the signal out of the noise but not amplify to such a large extent the ground noise component because it's going to you know, you're going to run out of headroom on these things. It's going to bang the, the input signal is going to come up hard against the um, plus and five volt rails. And, uh, you know, well, actually it won't on these because it's got um, um, a version of Baker clamps on it, which is um, a diode configuration, high speed diodes, well, BAV 99s um, on the, uh, well, basically, um, across the gain resistor back onto the input. So it can't get up near the voltage rails, but it will bang um, the limit of the diodes, um, but uh, it can't go past that. And that's meant to give it a faster recovery. Uh, if, if you get too much signal excursion, it takes um, a while to settle things down. Um, op amps don't like that. They don't like getting banged up against their uh, supply rails. So Mine Lab have put, I'll just point that out to you, where they are. They've got, um, okay, where am I? There I am. Ooh. Okay. That there, that there. The, these are um, run series parallel for one channel, series parallel for the other channel. Um, you know, there's your gain resistor there, um, non-inverting re resistors there. And... What else? What else? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I, I nearly, I've nearly got to tell you guys this because I did say about replacing those two, right? Bear with me on this. Sorry for going on a little bit too long, but I've got to do this. If you're going to unsolder 
these, right? And the detector's been on in the last week. Do yourself a favor. Find, okay, I gotta, I'll point this out very, I gotta find out where I am, there I am. You can see here, next to this big diode, this here is two points of a capacitor, big capacitor on the other side of the board. This will not bleed off, it will hold voltage. And what will happen is you will solder, unsolder this bridge, bridge the um, pins here, and what it'll do, if I get down, where am I? I was trying to work out where I am. Hang on a sec. I'll go look at look at the board. Okay, I'm too far away, aren't I? There we go. There, there, there. Okay, here, this one. Um, that's a uh, just a standard bipolar transistor. That that will blow up, right? And when you put because this blows up, when you put these on. Um, they won't switch, they'll be in conduction, and you'll turn the detector on, they'll blow up again, right? And the worst thing is, you'll blow that up, blow that up, you blow that up, and you also take out the input stage on the front end. You've got to be very careful. Um, you'll take out um, the, um, that um, MOSFET there, you'll take that MOSFET there out. You can take out the BAV99 uh, diodes, uh, it can have a disastrous effect. Make sure, right, that you discharge that pin to that pin. Take just hit hit it with a pair of side cutters on top, so you can actually get to the metal of the pins through the white paint. Just snip, snip a little bit, and I, I just bang it with my side cutters, and you'll see sparks. It'll it'll generate sparks and carry on. But you got to discharge this capacitor before you touch anything around here because it'll have a flow on effect and blow things up, right? Because uh, you'll lose your, um, what is it? Uh, it's a, that transistor I was pointing out, that little uh, driver one. Where is she? That one there, that's a BAV99 there. That's the uh, driver, it's it's a PNP. It's a 100 milliamp um, um, B, BC, um, what is it? Uh, 857, I think, for memory. Anyway, don't put a slug in there. Put a good uh, transistor. Uh, those transistors come in different um, noise gradients as well. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Get a G. They're the best. Um, you don't want to have noise generated into the gates that you receive FETs, right? Um, yeah, trick of the trade. Okay, that's enough. That's um, over an hour. Catches.